I have uh, I have served in Iraq. It's actually my fourth tour there now, fourth tour. and I've served there at least part of every year other than 2007 since 2003. Um, and uh, and so I have uh, one of the advantages I have in my current job is a is a sort of a longer a longer term perspective. Uh, one of my duties and responsibilities in the current job I have is to serve as a spokesman. I'm an infantry guy. I've never done public affairs uh, things before, uh, but I learn a lot every day. So uh, uh, hopefully I won't stumble along too much. I do want to uh, I do want to make some opening comments, and uh, let me just start by saying I think this is a very very important time for Iraq. It's a very important time for the United States. It's a very important time. Uh, for our relations between the two countries. There are a lot of transitions ongoing and we can dive into detail on any of those if you want to. We can talk about transitions of responsibilities uh, to the U.S. mission in Iraq, particularly with things like police professionalization, police development. Um, we also are, by the nature of, uh, of a, or by, as a re result of a requirement from the bilateral security agreement that our two countries negotiated and signed in 2008, uh, we are also in the midst of a series of transitions with U.S. forces. These transitions have been enabled by, and this includes a transition from Operation Iraqi Freedom, where we had to lead for combat operations and lead for security, to New Dawn, where we became focused on stability operations. They're enabled by growing capabilities of the Iraqi security forces. Um, and uh, it's, they have developed uh, quite, a deal, quite a bit in, uh, in their quantity, more than 650,000 troops now, uh, an army that's organized around 14 divisions, uh, a growing capability in the Navy. The Navy has responsibility for security of both of their oil platforms and about 80% their territorial waters, increasing capability of the, uh, of the Air Forces and the uh, Army Aviation Command. Um, but I think what's, what's as important rather than the numbers of the troops or how modern their equipment is, they do have modern equipment um, and are getting more every day, is, uh, is what we have seen in a, uh, in a, uh, a shift in values that make up some of their professional military culture. P.J. Dermer and I, P.J. and I were involved in starting in 2003 with starting the security forces up. And even back then, we recognized that we were going to have to work very hard to change the culture. And I'm not talking about societal culture, but the professional military culture that, uh, that these guys had come from. Their experience was very different than what we thought would work in a democracy. And so from the beginning, we have been working to change that. Ideas that, you know, there's value in having a professional non-commissioned officer corps. That officers should lead by example. Um, that the, the role of military forces exists to support the people and protect the people rather than uh, serve with blind loyalty to just one individual. Those kinds of things. So it's been, it's been, um, Working with the Iraqi security forces day to day over the year. My second tour, I was with the police commandos for a year in 2005 and six, as a transition team guy, as an advisor. Uh, day to day, very very frustrating, but month to month, year to year, very very rewarding because you see the changes with a, with kind of a long term perspective, and uh, and the light bulbs do in fact go off. And so the Iraqi military, the security forces that we have now are very different than the ones we saw in the past. And this is one of the things that, uh, that causes me to be hopeful for the future. As an example, they recognize and they, they regularly take on um, what, what their weaknesses are, what their needs are. They look at their performance uh, very closely uh, when they conduct operations and, and maybe even more importantly when it doesn't go well uh, compared to when it goes well in the past. They would have just relieved a couple of guys or executed a couple of guys and moved on to something else. And now what they do is a, a pretty thorough uh, critique of themselves. And then they apply what they learn. And, and the results are you see, you see in fact, differences in outcomes. Uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, conducted a, a, a terrible attack in March of this year. 
uh, focused on provincial council uh, headquarters in Tikrit, uh, the capital of Saladin province. They executed a number of people. Uh, the response from the Iraqi security forces uh, was such that they did not cover themselves with glory. Uh, but rather than just fire a bunch of people and move on, they spent a lot of time studying it and trying to learn from it. And then they, in fact, applied a lot of those lessons. They did things like uh, or change their organization, where they, they lined up a squadron from their Army Aviation Command and married them up with the Special Operations Forces so they could develop a habitual relationship. Um, and they train together and operate together every day. And, and so two months after that, we saw a very similar attack by Al-Qaeda focused on the Provincial Council headquarters in uh, Bakuba. Very, very different outcomes. Uh, and the Iraqi security forces did, in fact, cover themselves with glory and brought all the terrorists to justice. Minimal civilian out or casualties. And it's, it's, I think it's an example of how they have become a, uh, a learning organization. They've also recognized that it's important to acknowledge their weaknesses and acknowledge uh, what their needs are, which, is, which has been very important to help inform their own leadership um, what their needs are as they look at and they consider what the future risks are to Iraq or what the future threats to Iraq are and they consider how much risk is out there and how much risk are they willing to tolerate, which ultimately is, has led to some discussions, which I'll get to in a minute, about where they might uh, still ask the United States. When you look at what the Iraqi security forces have done, I talked a little bit about their capabilities and quantity and quality, but this was really the, the uh, primary factor that enabled us to transition from a focus on combat operations and what we were doing under Operation Iraqi Freedom to focus on stability operations. Uh, it was that they took the lead for security. And so on the three major military tasks we've had under stability operations uh, have been, uh, first of all, to advise, train, assist, and equip the Iraqi security forces. Secondly, to continue to conduct partner counterterrorism operations. And then thirdly, to support and protect the civilian workers that come from the U.S. mission in Iraq. Previously, United Nations as well. We don't do that anymore. Um, but uh, as they work to build civil capacity throughout, uh, throughout the country. By any measure you'd like to use, uh, I think the Iraqi security forces are, uh, are doing a credible job. Um, if you look at the number of attacks per day in Iraq, the amount of casualties, uh, I mean, we saw some some uh, uh, a concerning uh, series of attacks this week on Monday. Um, we saw the same, very similar attacks a year ago at this time. It's also at about this point in Ramadan, Al Qaeda in Iraq conducted a series of uh, complex attacks at that time, ranging from Basra to Mosul. Um, and at this time, it looks like just as far south as Kut or Najaf uh, up to Mosul. Um, but, but the Iraqi security forces then, uh, as and even more so now, have responded well. They defeated a number of VBIDs. They found and cleared IDs. Those things didn't get reported very loudly. Uh, but they're doing a credible job. When you look at the overall levels of violence, it's very, very different than what it was once. You know, in, in, in the first seven months of, of this year, we've averaged about 14 attacks per day nationwide. And that's focused on all targets. Iraqi civilians, Iraqi security forces, U.S. troops, about 14 attacks per day. Um, in 2007, we averaged 145 attacks per day across the entire year. You know, many days over 200. Um, so, you know, less than 10% of what we did, what we had in the past. This doesn't mean that things are all peachy. It doesn't mean that there's there's not room for continued development of the Iraqi security forces, that security needs to continue to improve. It certainly does. Uh, but when you take it in the long-term context, they have headed in the right direction and have been able to keep the lid on things every point of the way, even when there was a lot of question about, you know, every step. There was concern about the Iraqi security forces. When we come out of the cities in June of 2009, are they going to be able to do it? The answer is yeah. And they did fine. How about when we transitioned to them taking the lead in the summer of 2010? 
or when we reduce our own troop presence down to below 50,000, is it going to be okay? Or are the wheels going to come off? And in the end, you know, they've been able to step up. Um, the last uh, six weeks in particular, uh, we have seen them increasingly take on the Iranian-backed militant groups, dominantly uh, Promise Day Brigade, Asab al-Haq, Qatab Hezbollah. And again, I'm sure we'll dive into detail on, on support from Iran and what's going on with them. But the Iraqi security forces uh, have, uh, have significantly increased both their conventional and special operations force missions against these uh, particular threats and are, are being very, very successful. Uh, so there's a lot of room, uh, I think there's room and cause for me to be optimistic. This doesn't mean that the ISF doesn't have room for improvement and doesn't have need to improve. I'll, I'll just highlight a couple of areas. First of all, intelligence. Uh, especially when you look at the counterterrorism efforts, and you, I mean, one, re it's easy to recognize that without good intelligence, you know, they are not going to be successful. We have been enabling them uh, for a very long time with respect to our counterterrorism efforts. Their, their assault forces are, are really superb. But, you know, actually uh, entering and clearing a building is only one aspect of a successful counterterrorism operation. What's the intelligence that leads to the right building, the right target? How do you get the guys there, um, whether it's infiltration from the ground or air? How do you get them out? What happens if it goes awry and you need air support? What happens if you need emergency medical evacuation? Those are the kinds of things that we've been, uh, we've been enabling all along. Increasingly, they're developing some capacity. Uh, but by and large, I, I think the two dominant weaknesses we see, and we see it in the special operations forces, we see it in the conventional forces, it affects counterterrorism operations. It affects, it affects what, what they've been doing on the counterinsurgency side. It affects internal threats. It affects external intelligence and logistics. Um, so their ability to sustain themselves, uh, which really starts with the amount of resources they put against sustainment, uh, is a place where, uh, where I think that uh, that they will continue to need to grow, and and, and uh, we can help, uh, but we can't solve the problem. Um, and the intelligence is, you know, there's a lot of issues with their needs for intelligence. It starts with a uh, almost unidimensional focus initially on human. Um, it's affected by uh, one of the remnants, I think, of the uh, of Saddam Hussein's regime, in that there's. A, there's a, a inability to trust each other that permeates the entire society. It, it certainly affects the security forces. It affects things like how different organizations or even within organizations, they share intelligence. And you all know better than I that we've had our own obstacles with sharing intelligence in the past. Uh, but, but fundamentally, we tend to trust each other. And, you know, if, if our system, our sustainment system, uh, is built on an idea of trust. If, if I say that, you know, I need new globe plugs for my Humvee, and I put that into the system, the system will believe me and, it, and assume that I'm telling the truth, and it works to, to get me what I need, whereas their system is built on one that is, uh, kind of assumes that you might not be telling the truth, so you need to prove it to me. And, of course, those kinds of things just add obstacles. Um, but in any case, I think intelligence is one area. Their ability to bring in other dimensions, signals intelligence, imagery intelligence, it's starting. They've got some capacity in their Air Force uh, using IF ISR. They've got an ability to downlink uh, live video feeds to commanders on the ground, but it's not widespread. And so it can be employed for very specific operations, but again, not widespread. They've got some nascent capabilities on the SIGINT side, particularly with the counterterrorism forces to help them with that, uh, finding the exact house they need to get into. We've helped with that. And over time, they will get more and more capability. But, but they've, got, they've still got a ways to go on intelligence, uh, collection, analysis, dissemination, all aspects of it. And we can obviously help there. Uh, the, uh, I mentioned uh, sustainment and logistics. The last 
the thing that I think that they really need help with is integration of combined arms, especially when you when you look at the external threats that they may face. It's just it's a very different situation. You know, this is a this is a military. Uh, this is a, a set of forces from the Ministry of Interior, including the Department of Border Enforcement, the Federal Police, all the various provincial police forces. That has been the fastest growing security force in the world for the last eight years. They had the highest top op, highest op tempo of any organization in the past eight years. But by necessity, they've been focused almost exclusively on internal threats. Um, and over the past year and a half or two years now, they've started to expand a little bit. They're starting to get more and more success with the Navy, um, looking at potential external threats. Uh, but they're really just at the beginning of this. They, uh, You know that they have made a decision to buy uh, M1 tanks. They had contracted for 140. There's 135 on the ground right now in Iraq. Uh, and we are training tank tank crews and the people who are going to maintain the tanks and we have a comprehensive program that will regardless of what happens uh, in discussions with the Iraqis will continue under the supervision of the ambassador as part of an office of security cooperation but training the crews and the guys who are going to maintain the tanks or the artillery pieces or the aircraft is only one aspect you know it's uh, it's a heck of a lot more complex when you got to figure out, okay, how am I going to separate the mortar rounds from the artillery rounds from the attack aviation from the fighter jets in that one piece of airspace when I'm looking to have a certain effect uh, at a key place on the ground. And that's going to take a long time to develop those skills. We think that, uh, that they need help there if they recognize that. Um, so I think we have seen a lot of bright spots and a lot of things that, uh, that cause me to be optimistic for the future with respect to their development. And in some cases, the military has helped pull them into uh, a sense of integration in the region, which is very, very important, especially the Navy. The Navy probably more than any other force because NAVSET has got such a great relationship with all the navies and the Coast Guard forces, most of them excludes one, I guess, in the, that operate in the Gulf. Um, and they have been able to leverage those relationships and introduce the Iraqis to all their neighbors. You know, Iraq spent so many years in complete isolation. Um, we think that it's, it would be good for them and good for the entire neighborhood if they rejoined the region. And I think they're, they're working hard to do just that. There's clearly some obstacles to it, not the least of which is Iran and Iran's efforts to try to keep Iraq isolated. Uh, I'll just, I'll deal into that with, uh, with, or I'll dive into that if you'd like on, on questions. I'd like to close with just some comments about the agreements we signed and um, in 2008, what they mean and where we might head in the discussions uh, that we, they have signaled to us that they want to begin. First of all, uh, we signed two agreements in 2008 with the Iraqi government. The first was a, uh, a bilateral security agreement which was necessary to give us the authorities to continue to operate in Iraq past the end of the December of 2008. You may remember that uh, our authorities at that, at that time were based on a UN Security Council resolution, but it was due to expire. And there was a couple of options that we were weighing. Were we going to seek an extension uh, or a, an addition from the Security Council resolution or something different? What we ended up with was something different, a bilateral security agreement, which gave us the authority, the U.S. forces, the authority to continue to operate in Iraq in 2009, 10, and 11. But one of the requirements of that security agreement were that Article 24 mandates that we transition to full, full civilian authority by the end of this year. We are, in fact, on track to do just that. Um, we have kept our personnel numbers at just under 50,000. We've got about 46,000 troops on the ground now because we wanted to preserve as much flexibility for General Austin uh, in dealing with the unknown and also because we had a lot of work to do across all three of those mission sets. So keeping our, our personnel numbers high has enabled us to do that. But we've transitioned bases all along. We haven't made a lot of noise about it. But you know, in 2007, we had 505 bases. And at the start of Operation New Dawn in September, we, had, we were down to 92. As of today, we've got 46. And so those numbers 
we're on track and those numbers continue to uh, continue to go down. As far as equipment goes, just since September we've re redeployed more than 1.2 million pieces of equipment and we still have a little less than that uh, to go, but all is on track. Um, our redeployment of equipment, our base transitions, and our reposturing of personnel, which will inevitably start here in the not too distant future, um, are all potentially affected by the signals from the Iraqi government uh, that they that they came out with on the 2nd of August, saying that they wanted to begin a series of discussions with us uh, about future military assistance uh, beyond the beginning of January of 2012. And uh, at this point, they, those discussions have not matured to the point where I would call them negotiations. Uh, they, we continue to prepare for what we think and look at options. Uh, we continue to develop options for what we think they may ask us for, uh, but they haven't come out for uh, in detail yet to say this is exactly what we want. Now the issue with us in these transitions I talked about, it does shape this because it, it affects the feasibility. You know, if they if they want us to operate out of, I used this example uh, just this morning with another group, but if they want us to operate out of Fob Sykes, which an airfield just south of Talafer in the western side of Nineveh province, we're, we're out of luck because we've already transitioned that. Uh, and so those kinds of options are close. And it doesn't mean it's impossible, but it's a lot more expensive in terms of not just monetary costs, but time, energy, manpower to go back somewhere that we've already transitioned. So every day that we go forward without the details, it starts, it starts to limit what the feasibility of the courses of action that we might present to the decision makers here in DC. I think that uh, the Iraqi, the leadership of the Iraqi government is still wrestling with what specifically they want to ask us for. But I think it's, I'm pretty confident in saying they are not gonna ask us for an extension of the current agreement. It doesn't suit their interests. I think that they have looked hard at their vulnerabilities. Uh, they understand what their vulnerabilities are, and they've got to make some decisions about about the risk that they can't underwrite that they're going to ask us to help close the gap on. But, and, and you all know, as well as anybody, the areas that they've talked about, whether it's maritime security, air sovereignty, uh, combined arms training, these kinds of things. But, but we haven't got a specific request yet. Once that request comes, then the decisions about if we're going to support it, and if so, how will all be made here in Washington, D.C.? And, and on the other side of the ocean, it's our job to provide options. And so this is what we wrestle with as we look at uh, what, is, uh, what is happening and what kind of options we could provide. Um, I am confident that regardless of the relationship that we have in the future with the Iraqi government, it's going to be shaped by the second agreement. And the second agreement that we signed in, in 2008 was a strategic framework agreement. The Strategic Framework Agreement aspires, and it hasn't gotten a lot of publication, but it, it aspires to an enduring partnership between our two countries, and it sets the conditions for cooperation in a wide variety of areas, everything ranging from uh, agricultural development, economic development, sharing science and technology, educational exchanges, defense and security cooperation, and I'm confident that anything uh, that we see in the future is going to be shaped by that. Uh, and it's very, that agreement, by the way, is very important to the, uh, to the Iraqi people. Um, so with that, uh, you know, I've taken uh, probably too much time.